uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee, Dr. Asad Mahdi, Dr. Hisham, and Dr. Walid uh, for inviting me for, for this uh, very nice uh, uh, webinars. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be with you. The uh, talk today uh, will be about the liberation from mechanical ventilation. Some people, they call it, they call it wean, weaning from mechanical ventilation or liberation. But liberation is much better than uh, weaning because weaning is a, a gradual process. While w when you attempt to wean somebody from mechanical ventilation, it has to be not gradual like what we used to do before, no. If patient is ready to be separated or liberated from mechanical ventilation, the process has to be as much as possible uh, fast. Uh, the objective of this presentation, I'm going to focus on some important messages and definitions without the, too much details because the details are there and everywhere in literature and, and, and even in, in other presentations. What I'm going to focus on is how to deal with those who fail the uh, liberation process, why they fail, and how we manage this failure. From the critical care ultrasonography main point of view, so I'm going to focus more and more on integrating the critical care ultrasonography in the process of liberation from mechanical ventilation failure and how to manage this failure. I don't have anything to disclose. And as you all know, the weaning or liberation constitute around 40 to 50 percent of the duration of mechanical ventilation. It's a very common practice in ICU. That every day we ask ourselves for those who are intubated, should we continue with mechanical ventilation in these patients or we should start weaning them from mechanical ventilation? So it's a common practice in ICU, and it carries either success or failure. But you have to put in mind for every patient, every day, to ask yourself this question. Should I start weaning or not? Because delaying weaning or delaying liberation from mechanical ventilation increases a lot of risk, risk of lengthier duration of mechanical ventilation, and this is will cost you a lot in, in, in ICU, a number of days, and in, in the other complications that is associated with uh, mechanical ventilation itself, like ventilator-associated pneumonia, ventilator-induced lung injury, ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, tracheal injury, and many other things. This is a few delay, but at the same time, you have to be very, very uh, vigilant not to start the process of weaning too early before the patient is ready for being uh, liberated from mechanical ventilation because early weaning is associated with uh, a risk of reintubation, hemodynamic and respiratory stress. This balance has to be there either not, not to start early and not to delay unnecessarily the weaning otherwise both of them will be costly, will be on, on the expenses of increasing mortality, length of stay, and of course cost in, in, in ICU uh, length of stay. So the weaning itself should mean that you liberate from mechanical ventilation and you have to remove the tube because it doesn't mean that only you disconnected the mechanical ventilation but does this patient proceed to be extubated or not? Because failure to wean include failure of spontaneous breathing trial and or reintubation. And if the patient require more than three breathing trial to be weaned, we're gonna come to what does it mean, spontaneous breathing trial later, or they, they take up to seven days from the first spontaneous breathing trial to be successfully weaned and extubated. We call this difficult weaning. We're supposed not to take more than one or two spontaneous breathing trials. And it, it shouldn't take 
these days, if it exceeds to require more than seven days, this means that you have, if you require more than uh, three attempts and you require more than seven days, this indicates that this process is very prolonged and there are many, many reasons for and uh, the, the process of uh, management has to be very difficult and, and, and will be very dramatically changed if you are dealing with prolonged weaning process. Weaning failure uh, is considered to be very common actually. It, 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 it's up to 25% of cases who meet the criteria, not in general. In general it might be the percentage might be more, but those whom you believe that they are requiring criteria to be weaned, 25% of them they fail, quarter. 13 to 26% of patients, even if they succeed to be successful in spontaneous breathing trial and you extubate them, up to 26%, up to another quarter, they are required to be reintubated within 24 hours. What we mean as a consensus in the literature, what, what does it mean extubation failure? It means one of these three uh, subtitles. Number one, need to reintubate within 48 hours, or need to have a non-invasive ventilation in the first 24, 48 hours, sorry, or death in the first 48 hours. So extubated and the patient die within the first 48 hours. This is extubation failure because it indicates that it wasn't successful. Uh, uh, there are certain weaning readiness criteria that has to be tested and to be on the front. You can have your school, your own school or your own protocol based on evidence, of course. But overall and after all, every patient who is neurologically with a Galascoma score conscious, more than nine, Galascoma score more, more than nine means the patient will be able to protect their way, to deal with their way. Of course, shouldn't be on a high ICP. Intracranial pressure has to be less than 20 millimeter of mercury. They should be on no or minimal sedation. They shouldn't be on any neuromuscular affecting drugs, especially neuromuscular blockade. And their neuromuscular status has to be competent, i.e. uncontrolled myothenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome, not well controlled, shouldn't be among patients to wean because Guillain-Barre syndrome, myothenia gravis, or any other neuromuscular disorders that affect diaphragm means that the diaphragm, which is the main muscle I'm going to come to touch this point later on, has to be completely healthy. Not completely, of course, but at least functioning properly to maintain their way, to maintain the breathing. Of course, there are general criteria. It's totally unwise to start to win somebody who is requiring high dose of vasopressors. They, sh they should be high hemodynamic and stable. This is, doesn't mean, again, that every patient on, on a small dose of vasopressors, like norepinephrine of less than 10 mics, can be weaned instead. I want to say that hemodynamics here is a package. It doesn't mean that you should rely on how much vasopressors you are using. If your patient for the sake of positive pressure is requiring small dose of levofed, but the other factors are fulfilled, fulfilled, you can try weaning. They shouldn't be, or at least preferably, not to be febrile. Hemoglobin, of course, has to be more than seven grams per deciliter. But again, if your patient is chronically anemic, this doesn't mean that you have to have a magic number of any number, no. Every patient is individualized, but a general rule, if you have the patient was unstable and now hemoglobin is less than seven, and this is acutely, and there is evidence of some upper GI bleeding, bleeding bare nose, bare at the tube, whatever it is, you have to stabilize the hemoglobin first. Hemoglobin is one of the main components of oxygen delivery. Albumin is preferable to be more than three. But again, in the clinical context, it has to be taken like nutritional status as well. Is 
it's not logic at all to try to win somebody who is malnourished, very cachectic, just coming out of a very severe critical illness and nutrition status is bad. This is, you're not going to expect this patient or this type of patients to be winnable. The ET tube is preferred to be good sized. Secretions should not be much and patient has to be able to cough and gag. And air leak has to be more than 30%. The exhaled type of volume has, when you deflate the, the, the cuff of the ET tube, you have to have a difference between the exhaled type of volume and inhaled type of volume by more than 30%. And this is well mean that the airway, the ET tube, is not surrounded by a significant edema in the trachea. So when you remove this foreign body, there will be no much significant edema to cause a significant stride or post extubation. And this is one of the common failure reasons in some of the patients, especially if you have history of repeated attempts to intubate or somebody with a trauma to their ways and some other very minor cases indication when to consider the air leak because the air leak is not mandatory to be among the criteria if you don't have history of airway trauma, either direct trauma to the airway or repeated attempts of intubation. Ventilatory parameters are very important to be taken into consideration. The spontaneous tidal volume in a spontaneous breathing trial has to be more than 6 ml per kg. Minute volume has to be around or less than 11 liter per minute because the more you have patients breathing very fast and they have small tidal volume and the minute volume might reach up to 15 or more, this means that they are very tachypneic and they're likely to fail. FI2, of course, has to be as minimal as possible. Patient can maintain saturation more than 92 and FI2 FI less than or equal to 0.5. PEEP has to be or less than 8, and the BF ratio, if you go with PF ratio, better to be above 150, which of course has to be toward normal. There are some predictors of success, like if you ask your patient to take very deep inspiration and you measure the negative inspiratory pressure, there is machine for that. The more the negative maximum inspiratory pressure is more than minus 30 centimeter water, the more likelihood of successful weaning. And the very famous uh, index that everybody's using and aware of in ICU is rapid shallow breathing index, the RSBI, which is you divide the respiratory rate by tidal volume in liters. So if you have somebody who's breathing with a respiratory of 20 and taken with every breath, spontaneous breathing. He has, patient has to be on a spontaneous breathing. And you have one of two ways. You have a weaning parameter machine, weaning uh, machine that connects to the airway if your patient is breathing without ventilator. And then it measures for you the tidal volume, the exhaled tidal volume. And you have the respiratory rate, you count them, or it's showed in the monitor. And then, for example, if you have a respiratory rate of 20 and tidal volume of 500, so 20 divided by 0.5 is 200 divided by 5, around 40. If you are in a spontaneous breathing mode with a pressure support of 5 to 8 centimeter and respiratory pressure and PEEP of 0 to 5, preferably to be 0, this is spontaneous breathing trial or tube compensation mode. Then ventilator will give you the, the respiratory rate and will give you the tidal volume and some of the machine also calculate for you the RSBR. The number of less than 105 is very good predictor of weaning success. There are predictor of failure. You have to expect that the older the patients, the likelihood of fail COPD have a high rate of failure. If they have high minute volume, if they are positive fluid balance, if they will prolong it on mechanical, more than seven days on ventilator is gonna result in a lot of complications. Among of them is critical illness, polyneuromyopathy, critical illness induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, 
and ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. Excuse me. Before you attempt to win, please try to optimize some important issues. As I mentioned, your patient has to be controlled temperature because as more as you allow them to be febrile, as more as they produce carbon dioxide, and this will be burden on respirator, on, on the respiratory system, to wash out this carbon dioxide. And continuity with this point, some people, they give extra carbohydrates to their patients. They overfeed their patients. And over carbohydrates is going to end in Krebs cycle by producing more carbon dioxide. And this is will be a burden or a load on the lung to wash out this carbon dioxide. You have to minimize or stop sedation. It's better to maintain your patient on a dry side. So there is no harm if the kidney is okay to give some doses before you extubate of furizamide and you keep your patient, if not negative, at least a balance. You consider a steroid if you have a a question mark about the air leak and edema of the upper airway. Muscle relaxant should be avoided at least to stop at 24 hours or more before you attempt to wean. There are a lot of protocols on the literature and from different body of societies. The, the, one of the most famous one is the one of ATS published in chest. And the, the summary of this uh, 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 guidelines is that better to have a protocolized care. What does it mean? Every unit has to have a protocol for weaning. So you have your patient on a pathway when you started ventilating for certain reason and you see that this reason is cleared up or under control, the process has to start automatically. It shouldn't be left for people to remember or not to remember that this patient is winnable or not. You have criteria. You have automated protocol. And this is, was found with some evidence to be better than non-protocolized care. Again, every single guideline is going to tell you you have to minimize the sedation. And then you start a spontaneous breathing trial in every ventilated patient every day, provided that they are winnable. There are criteria which we mentioned before. If they met or a majority of them met, then you start every day to see if your patient is winnable. Put them on a spontaneous breathing trial and see if you can able to extubate them. And very brief, the spontaneous breathing trial, SBT, means that you're going to shift from the assessed ventilation, past the pressure assessed ventilation to unassessed ventilation. You just put a pressure support. A spontaneous breathing guitar can be with any spiratory pressure augmentation, just minimal pressure support during inhalation to overcome the resistance of the tube, of the ventilator tubes and entrical tube, five to eight centimeters. If you have a tracheostomy, five is enough to overcome the resistance. There in some machines, you have tube compensation. Or you might go with, as, as some people would prefer actually, to go with a TP trial or CPAP of zero, that there's no pressure at all, and see for 30 minutes up to 120 minutes maximum. You shouldn't go beyond 120 minutes. Either is a patient is winnable, take the pathway of successful weaning, or after 120 minutes maximum, you should not make patients suffering by no pressure support, and they are not winnable. This is totally increases the work of breathing and a lot of hemodynamic and respiratory stresses. So either augmenting, augmenting the inspiratory pressure or not augmenting on TBs, whatever way you go with. There are signs of failure of spontaneous breathing trial. If your patients start to be tachy or bradycardic, with a change of the baseline of the heart rate of more than 20%, high poor hypertension again with a change from the baseline of 20% up or down. So hypertension or hypotension can be a sign of failure, sweating, tachypnea or bradypnea. 
acting ايه لاني زا intercostal activity abdominal paradoxical movement desaturation hypercapnia acidosis decrease in central venous oxygen saturation or decrease in perfusion is considered that all are signs of failure of, of spontaneous breathing trial as a magic rule in everything in medicine and let, let me say in, in ICU that you shouldn't go with one vital sign abnormality but you have to have a constellation of things and you put them together either in diagnosis or in treatment intervention do not rely on one side you have to have a constellation of things and we used to say that one abnormal sign doesn't mean anything but more than one abnormal vital sign means a lot so these are the signs and you can go you can go with it. again when you attempt a spontaneous breathing trial you have one of two pathways either patient successfully winnable and then they will be extubated or they fail my focus on here is going to be if your patient fail there are on the literature if you go to any review you're going to see that people talking about most common reason to fail the most common reason to fail in this sequence is lung muscle weakness specifically the diaphragm and cardiac dysfunction but this doesn't mean that you should not doesn't mean that you should ignore this other very very important factors to fail the weaning patients who are having delirium it's a common and serious icu complications and it's associated with failure and actually people are underestimating delirium and in very short term definition delirium means that your patient neurologically brain wise is not fat some people they call, they call it acute brain injury or acute brain dysfunction delirium is wax and waning of the consciousness and it indicates that you have a very serious burden on the interior or homeostasis of your patients so you have to consider this an ICU per se is a serious environment to cause delirium most if not the majority of our drugs used in icu causes delirium mechanical ventilation causes delirium and continue to the mechanical ventilation patient ventilator asynchrony if you are ventilating for three or four or more days and the asynchrony index is high this indicates that you had a patient who suffered this whole journey to be on mechanical ventilation and don't expect them to travel through the journey of weaning very smoothly so you have to be ready once you put your patient on ventilator to take care of the patient ventilator agreement or synchrony it has to be fulfilled in a smooth way otherwise if they are asynchronous most of the time they're going to fail depression ladies and gentlemen is very serious side effect of icu and you are anesthesia people you are the the uh, uh, pillars behind any anesthesia there is what we call verbal anesthesia verbal anesthesia means that you go and talk to your patient we ignore this point before you start any management plan and specifically when you change your management plan you have to talk to your patients if they are listening and conscious and of course if you start to win somebody majority of the, those who are winnable are conscious or supposed to be conscious talk to them tell them that i'm going to win you describe the process of winning to them take them in your side take your your patient in your side assure them and believe me we see people that are using or abusing or overusing sedatives while just talking and assuring touching patients might do effect much more powerful than drugs in calming patients so play, please pay attention to this do not forget thyroid thyroid dysfunction is common in critically ill and it affects muscles and every single organ in the body adrenal gland 
is found not to be uncommon disorder in critically ill patients. So put them in mind before you go to the common reasons for patients to fail the mechanical ventilation. Let's start with the lung. When the respiratory muscle load increase, increases by the increase in resistance or decrease in compliance, resistance means that the resistance in the airway will increase and compliance is either lung or chest wall or both of them. But also, if the intrinsic PEEP increases, this is, will increase the muscle load, the respiratory muscle load, which is a surrogate of increased work of breathing. So, if the airway resistance increases, you have to look for the airway, why it's a dysfunction. Most common reason gonna be 80, or airway secretions, might be kink, might be bronchospasm, maybe tracheomalacia or tracheal stenosis. And don't forget that if you have a, a tracheostomy patient, then granulation tissue inside the tracheostomy or down to the tracheostomy uh, uh, entrance is found to be not uncommon to cause failure to wean. In COPD patients, Characteristically, they have early collapse of their airways before the expiratory time finish, plus the airway edema. So the airways will be edematous and they collapse before the expiratory time finish. This is what causes dynamic hyperinflation. And this will increase the, the O2 beep. And this will end by increasing the work of breathing. You have to deal with this by bronchospasm uh, treatment, giving bronchodilators, giving steroids and everything to make the, the, uh, uh, the uh, resistance decrease. Compliance of the lung reduces when you have alveolar filling by edema, pulmonary edema, by pus or fluid, whatever the reason is, atelectasis, fibrosis, pneumonia. Don't forget the pleural effusion or increase in intra-abdominal pressure and obesity is gonna restrict the compliance of the chest wall. And this is, might be the reason for the patient to fail the weaning process or to fail after you extubate even. I wanna say here that draining the pleural fluid might be the solution. Because if you increase or give a chance for the chest wall to be compliant, you give a chance for the lung to work in a smooth way. Lung ultrasound is helpful because as some people are going with lung scores. If you see a lot of vertical lines in different areas of the lung, it indicates that the parenchyma is wet or there is increase in extravascular lung water. You have to give diuresis to diurese these patients. If you have signs of collapse and reduction of the uh, uh, air containing spaces or consolidation or de recruitment, this means that you might probably need to be on positive pressure or to have non-invasive post-extubation. If you don't have a sliding lung point, this might diagnose for you the pneumothorax. Lung ultrasound was found to be very beneficial in the process of weaning, and this is actually uh, indicated to have a separate maybe presentation later on. How to optimize the factors, as I mentioned, don't forget to use the bronchodilators before and after the extubation or weaning. Consider the intratracheostomy or down to the tracheostomy uh, 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 inner cannula plugs or granulation tissue. Dry lung is better than the wet lung and you drain the pleural effusion if it's significant uh, effusion. The frag. The second vital organ that people, they are mess or underestimating the rule in respiratory system in general. Diaphragm is the most active muscle in the body. It works in 30 to 40% of the time. And even while you're sleeping, diaphragm is working. 80% of the inspiratory effort comes from the diaphragm. So it plays a crucial role in success of weaning. 40 to 50% of the diaphragmatic function will be lost after few days, if not few hours of mechanical ventilation. It's one of the very bad impact of mechanical ventilation on the body that it atrophy 
or dysfunction the diaphragm. Cross-sectional area of the diaphragm will lose around a quarter of its power after seven days of mechanical ventilation. This is by evidence, by evidence that the del del deleterious effect of mechanical ventilation on diaphragm unfortunately remains for a very long time. And I bet you that you might remember now I'm talking, a lot of patients whom you wean them off ventilator and they remain very hypotonic in on their skeletal limb muscles. The diaphragm is almost, as, it is a skeletal muscle and almost like your limb muscles is affected like this limb muscle not less than them at all. So you have to put the diaphragm in mind. And actually, the more you allow the machine to take over, the less you allow the diaphragm to function. And any muscle which remains unfunctioning is gonna atrophy. If you don't move for one day or two, your muscle will atrophy and diaphragm is the same. There are a lot of evidence in the literature, in big journals, indicating what I'm saying, atrophy of the diaphragm with mechanically ventilated patients. So let's see how can we monitor the diaphragm. Diaphragmatic ultrasound is very good uh, 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 modality that you have to see the diaphragm with. Diaphragm, ladies and gentlemen, I consider it, and some people, more expert than me, they consider it one of the vital signs in critically ill patients. And they overstay, they used to say, if you are monitoring the respiratory rate, temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure as four vital signs, why you don't monitor the diaphragm? You have to see the diaphragm. How can we see them morphologically and functionally? The best way is to go with ultrasound. There are two modalities that you, we use to assess the diaphragm, to see the diaphragm with ultrasound. Thickness fraction, the thickness of the diaphragm change with inspiration. As any muscle, when it contract, the thickness of the muscle with contractility will increase by at least 30%, thickness fraction. Or how much the diaphragm goes high and goes down, the excursion up, with a spontaneous breathing. This is what we call diaphragmatic excursion. We use high frequency probe to see, as you see here in this movie, this is the liver here, I hope you, you, you see it, the liver and the lung coming, crossing as if it's a curtain, opening and closing. There are three layers above the liver and down to the, the lung, Thickening, it changes with every inhalation. When the lung comes like this, you see that the three layers change in thickness. This is the diaphragm. You can measure when you focus during the inhalation. This is during the exhalation and during the inhalation. See the size during the inhalation, 0.646 centimeter. During the exhalation, when its muscle is relaxed, 0.53. The thickness fraction here is when you take the inhalation thickness minus the exhalation thickness divided by the exhalation thickness, you time this by 100%. And if this thickness percentage normally in me and you, it's more than 50% increases, muscle increase very significantly within aspiration. In critically ill patients, if it's more than 30%, it's a very good predict predictive of weaning success with a sensitivity of 88 and a specificity of 71%, which is a very good percentage, by the way. It's even equal, if not better than the RSPI. The excursion is, when you have the diaphragm, we have to have the echo probe, both in the subcostal area, directed to the dome of the diaphragm, and then you see the diaphragm as you see now. This is the liver up here, and there is a scoop here, like a spoon. And then this is the diaphragm. This, the white line here is diaphragm. I put the M mode over the diaphragm, has to be perpendicular to the diaphragm, and then I fire it. When I fire it, 
I see the excursion, the curve you see here. Then you have to see how much it goes up. This is what we call it the excursion. Normally, it has to be around two or more than two to predict that this diaphragm is able to breathe, to function well, and to predict successful weaning. And it was found to be in most of the literature around two or 2.5. If less than this, in the case that the diaphragm is weak. But you have to be very cautious here and vigilant that this is, has to be in a spontaneous mood, not on a controlled mechanical ventilation. Because the positive pressure, if you are controlling the ventilation or giving high pressure support, the effort of the diaphragm, of, of the ventilator or pressure support will push the diaphragm up and down. So this is not indicator of a spontaneous diaphragmatic excursion. It has to be in a minimal, spontaneous breathing trial pressure support. There is another important point here, which is the slope or velocity. The velocity is the speed of the diaphragm to go high was how much? It has to be less than 1.5, 1.3 centimeter per second. Because as more the velocity is prolonged, it means that the diaphragm is suffering to go up. And this means the diaphragm is weak. The slope or velocity has to be less than 1.3. Automatically, it will be measured by the, the machine. And the velocity, as I mentioned, is the slope up speed, how long it goes in how many seconds. This is what we mean by velocity. By this technique, we can measure the inspiratory time. The inspiration starts from the beginning of the curve. And at the top of the curve, the inhalation will end, and then the exhalation will start. So you can measure the inspiratory time, you can measure the expiratory time before the other cycle starts, and this is, would be very beneficial. It would be very beneficial to see and diagnose if your diaphragm is paralyzed or weak. If the diaphragm moves in the other way direction, like here, in the opposite direction, means that this is paradoxically moving. So this diaphragm is either very weak or even paralyzed. You can diagnose patient ventilator synchrony with ultrasound. If you have the ventilator cycle on the machine monitor and you have the, the excursion up and down, you can see if they are consistent together. The inspiratory time of mechanical ventilator consists with the excursion or not, and this is to diagnose the uh, uh, patient ventilator synchrony. There are a lot of evidence that when we combine diaphragm ultrasound and lung ultrasound to predict weaning failure, you, good, you have a good, very good outcome. You can monitor the diaphragm by EMG, and there is a famous, well-known, and I, I'm not sure if it's available in Egypt, in McKay, uh, neurally adjusted ventilatory assessed mood in servo eyes. There is what we call it NAVA modules. That means that the respiratory center is controlling the diaphragm and diaphragm is controlling the inspiratory time and expiratory time. If you can monitor this with this simple catheter that we insert in nasogastric, it's a nasogastric tube, goes to the esophagus and then to stomach. At the junction between the esophagus and stomach, there is a sensor to sense the diaphragmatic activity. And this is what we mean by NAVA. Look at this screen. The, the, the fourth wave here is the, the diaphragm waves. It will tell you if the diaphragm is working or not. This is the first one. Nava mood means when the diaphragm starts to contract, an order will go to ventilatory, inspiratory circle to open, and then the tidal volume will be delivered. Once you reach the peak of tidal volume, a signal will go from diaphragm when it reaches the peak activity, diaphragm peak activity, then with the slope down of diaphragmatic activity, a signal will go to a respiratory center in the brain to tell that this is the expiratory time. And the ventilator here has to comply. If, if there is compliance here, this is what we call it synchrony. So the synchrony in another definition is the agreement between the diaphragm and ventilator and the diaphragm is under control of the respiratory center. So the patient will drive and control the inspiratory cycle, inspiration and in expiration time. 
one of the two major side effects of pressure support is asynchrony and overassessed. How you know the asynchrony with NAVA? If you see that the, the, the NAVA or diaphragmatic wave is not consistent with the ventilator wave, this is asynchrony, as simple as that. If you look at here on this top uh, right side, this is diaphragmatic activity. While there is no air delivered with this cycle at all, the respirator was in the expiratory time. So this was wasted effort. The diaphragm contracted, but the respirator or ventilator does not respond. While in here, see, the diaphragm was contracting and the machine was starting to give the tidal volume in, but was not also again synchronous. Again, another diaphragm contractility with no cycle opening. This is totally synchronous. You can see if your diaphragm, while the patient is ventilated, is dead or functioning. And uh, one of the messages that I want to deliver today is your patient's on ventilator has to have every now and then diaphragm allowed to work, otherwise it will go to sleep. And this is the reason for atrophy. Volume control, pressure control. Look at the diaphragm at the bottom here, it's a flat. So the ventilator take over everything and the diaphragm doesn't work at all. This is means after a few days, if not few hours, this diaphragm will flatten. We'll have critical illness and ventilator induced diaphragmatic injury, which is very serious. Look, an SIMV, while you're allowing some uh, spontaneous Mandatory breathing intermittent, there is no diaphragmatic activity at all. Not only that, but also look at here. This is pressure support. Everyone believes that pressure support means spontaneous breathing. You just give a pressure support during the inhalation time and ventilator will give the pressure support, but the patient is breathing. No, look at the diaphragm with pressure support. It's a flat because the diaphragm here is over suppressed by high pressure support. 17 over 12 of P, what's this? You have to allow the diaphragm to work. How can you allow the diaphragm to work? You allow spontaneous breathing every now and then. Small pressure support, cautious, judicious use of pressure support. NAVA, BAV, SIMV with low respiratory rate. And once you can allow spontaneous breathing, it's like a limb physiotherapy. Diaphragm physiotherapy is allowing the spontaneous breathing. Allow it to work. Don't forget the diaphragm, please. Allow it to work, except if you have a very severe contraindication to control totally the ventilator breath. Like in, in very early RDS, like in severe hemodynamic instability, like in very high ICP, you cannot allow spontaneous bleeding, of course. Levosimindan, the butamine theophylline was found to, to, uh, uh, to improve the diaphragmatic dysfunction. This is the advantages of allowing spontaneous breathing. I hope I'm not, I'm not taking very long time, Dr. Saad. Dr. But okay, just a few minutes uh, left because we are uh, 45 minutes sure. now. Thank you. Sure, uh, sure. Thank, thank you very you. much. We'll go to the heart. Heart-lung interaction is very important to understand because the heart will be affected dramatically, negatively, badly, with positive pressure. Preload and afterload will change on the right ventricle and, and, and left ventricle. And this is at the end of the day will result in that you have a pulse pressure maximum during the expiration or inspiration, ventilated or non-ventilated. But what I want to say is when you have assisted mechanical ventilation, pulse pressure ventilation, the intrathoracic pressure is increased. This is both the pressure. And this is will reduce the, the venous return, decrease the left ventricle filling pressure, in, decrease the afterload filling pressure, uh, afterload pressure. So this is the main mechanism for the pulmonary edema to respond. If you shift to spontaneous breathing, you are in unassisted breathing on mechanical ventilator. This is what result in the intrathoracic pressure. will reduce venous return, will increase left ventricle filling pressure will increase, afterload will increase. This is my result in this function of the left ventricle and right ventricle. In 42% of failure, are due to cardiac reason, due to cardiac reason. And the spontaneous breathing, TBS was found to be worse or bad compared to spontaneous breathing mode in inducing cardiac dysfunction. And 
cardiac dysfunction is both affecting left and right ventricles, both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. How we can monitor the cardiac function and winnable pa patient, excuse me, you have non-invasive techniques, echo or probe in B. The higher the probe in B, a simple lab test, just send it at C. If it goes high, with the process of weaning, it indicates that you have burden on the left ventricle or pulmonary edema. The higher the probe NB above 600 indicates the possibility of failure to wean, and there is a lot of evidence on this. I'm going to come to this. Some people, they go with the swan gans to measure the cardiac output, pulmonary cardiac which pressure, and many other invasive, which is not needed nowadays if you have echo. You can measure by echo the cardiac output, the diastolic dysfunction parameters, left ventricle filling E to A and E to E prime, TR velocity, and left atrial volume. You can just by eyeballing, look at the left ventricle and right ventricle contractility. Look at this one, apical for a chambers. Left ventricle is poorly contracting. Do you imagine that this type of patient can be winnable? Look at the diastolic dysfunction here. E to A, uh, A, e to A ratio is high. E to A prime is 24. In the case of the pulmonic average pressure is more than 18. So the lung is be, will be filled here with, with water once you remove the positive pressure. So you have to maximize the cardiac function here before you attempt to wean. If you have a wet lung like this, do you expect, compared to this lung on the left side, with A lines, no B lines like what you see here, vertical lines that indicates that the intravascular, intraparenchymal lung volume is high, indicates with lung, and of course you have to dry the lung before you go. When you combine the cardiac and lung ultrasound, there is a chance to predict weaning success and weaning failure, and there is very good evidence in the literature to support this as well as, as I mentioned, in natritic peptide. If you have somebody who's cardiac and the cardiac function is bad before the weaning, during the spontaneous breathing trial and after, please, you can try to use nitroglycerin to reduce the preload and for the right ventricle and left ventricle, this is might help. And also the use of levosimindan to biotamin can be tried and there are a lot of evidence and very promising results of these trials of use levosimindan and the biotamin to increase the contractility and cardiac output, which will impact on diaphragm and overall cardiac function, of course. Treatment of any heart failure should include diuresis, its inhibitor, and it drops even if you need calcium channel broker. So bottom line, you have to maximize the cardiac function before you go and mean. To sum up, integrating the critical care ultrasonography while you're trying to wean before the spontaneous breathing try, identify the high-risk group. Any patient with bad cardiac function with evidence of high filling pressure with AA, E to A ratio, E to E prime, and ejection fraction. If the lung score and presence is high, more than 13, I, I may give you a lecture if you allow me, Dr. Sadan. The, the organizing committee later on about how to use the lung ultrasound. If you have pleural effusion, consider to drain the pleural effusion. During the spontaneous breathing trial, don't forget to assess lung, heart, and diaphragm because you should not attempt to extubate. If you have a question that one of these organs are affected, the heart is not good, lung is not irritated, diaphragm is not contracting well. After a spontaneous breathing trial, there is what we call weaning induced pulmonary edema or repo. This is, can be diagnosed easily by echo. Lung ultrasound will help to see if the lung is de-recruited and the diaphragmatic weakness can be easily diagnosed by here. Thank you very much. I'm ready for any question. Uh, Dr. Hisham. Dr. Hisham. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf, for the very interesting uh, lecture. Really, really, we interested uh, يعني, very much in the uh, topic, and uh, it was very interesting lecture uh, regarding the questions.
we have a question here. Uh, question number one, uh, Dr. Ash, uh, can you please uh, explain uh, the hazards of uh, early weaning of a pneumonic patient uh, suffering uh, COVID-19? Yeah, very good question. First of all, you should not be deceived by early improvement of any COVID ERDS patient. Because as far as uh, we see from the uh, expertise from all, all over the world, from Italy group and from uh, now the, the uh, uh, American people, they are insisting in this message, among many other important messages, that COVID-19 patients, they start to improve, and then when they have the storm of cytokine release, then they have very aggressive deterioration. And I have a lot of case scenarios I heard of, uh, for, for people even I know, Salan Shfiun, that they started to improve and then bombed, they, 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 they flap all, all over and deteriorate very aggressively. Bottom line, <clears throat> you have to be very patient with your COVID ERDS patients not to win very rapidly. But you have to fulfill all the criteria before you start win. And thank you for this question because you have to control the cytokines and the, the surge of inflammation, very well controlled. With anti-inflammatory steroid, you have to be very sure that things are all under control, especially the heart and, and hemodynamics. Cardiac dysfunction in COVID-19 patients is found in the literature to be very common. More than 30% of patients, they have myocarditis and cardiac dysfunction. And this is one among the main reasons for patients to fail. And so don't start the process of weaning and mean that you decrease the ventilatory support. I'm not talking about spontaneous breathing trial or extubation. When it comes to extubation, it's not bad to delay cautiously, judiciously, the extubation time. You have to be sure that you're gonna have a very successful journey. Otherwise, keep them on ventilator. Uh, the next question is, uh, what's your opinion about using the APRV in such patients? I don't, ha I, I don't have much experience on ABRV. I don't have much experience with. But it's a, a, I hear that it's a great, good, but I didn't work with. Another question from uh, Dr. Yusuf Shura. For you, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Uh, Ashraf. The question is application of diaphragmatic pacing. Is it beneficial? Application of diaphragmatic pacing. Yeah, th there are some works on, but it has to have certain indications. And it's a very sophisticated. Uh, there are a lot, not a lot of uh, centers they are doing. In Saudi Arabia here, we have only one center in, in Riyadh, and they do maybe in, in the last few years, they did two. Uh, it has to be inf uh, a phrenic nerve injury, total injury. There is no much reported cases about critical illness or diaphragmatic induced, ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, because fortunately, though it takes long time to recover, but they recover and they don't need pacing. It works for phrenic nerve injury with no much experience with uh, among uh, in, in the whole world, actually. I don't know what's the status in, in Egypt. So the main message from today, which I want to deliver kindly, is allow spontaneous breathing even in ERDS patients. Once they move BF ratio from uh, 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 or above 150, you can allow them spontaneous breathing. Nava mood is found to be very, very beneficial to allow the diaphragm to work, to allow the patient ventilator synchrony to be optimal, and to minimize the sedation. I have a lecture on Nava, but I don't know if 
if NAVA is available in Egypt, because we don't want to talk about something which people they don't know and they don't practice. As you ask me about ABRV, my, my, my ICU has, has no mode of ABRV. If you don't have the, module, the servo I machine from McKay and you don't have the module of NAVA, then talking about something is not available is nonsense. But allow spontaneous breathing, allow the diaphragm to work. This is was found to be the best physiotherapy of diaphragm. There is some, some work on uh, doing some external physiotherapy by a nerve stimulation and certain machines to train the diaphragm. This is also was found to be with no much evidence beneficial. 